in considering uh, the human data, and this is human studies, um, these are epidemiologic studies, predominantly they're what we would call cohort studies, which are, for those of you who are not epidemiologists, they're studies of a group of people who share a similar exposure that we're, uh, we're interested in looking at, and we're generally looking back historically for records of, of a large group of people who had that exposure, and then look at their uh, rates of cancer over time compared to people who didn't have that, or by levels to which they might have been exposed to a particular agent or carcinogen. Uh, the other type of study that's generally considered are case control studies, where uh, what happens is in a particular defined geographic region usually, um, people with a particular type of cancer are interviewed about their history of different types of exposures, and then a group of randomly selected or otherwise representative group is, receives the same interview and the history of exposure is compared to people who have the cancer versus don't have the cancer. If a cancer is very rare, um, they might use, they might simply look at the histories of a series of patients. But generally we're looking at large scale epidemiologic studies. The, uh, all the studies that are considered by IARC, except for the ones in the exposure area, have to be in what we call the peer reviewed literature. They have to be published in a journal where they're reviewed by independent scientists and or they could be from a government agency where they have been out in public scrutiny. So it can't be a government report that nobody's ever seen before. It has to be a government report that's kind of public knowledge, knowledge and out there and one that has been at least under scrutiny of the, of the, uh, the broader scientific community. Then that body of studies have to be judged as to whether or not they provide sufficient evidence of carcinogenicity, limited evidence, or inadequate evidence. And I put here kind of a, I tried to put at least a fairly common language definition of bias, uh, which is basically a distortion of study results uh, due to how data on either disease or exposure are collected or who's actually recruited into a study. Now this is quite different from confounding, which is uh, where we get a distortion, which is not due to how we did the study per se in terms of how we measured the things we're looking at, but it's due to the fact that we didn't take into account something else that might be causing this. And last is this issue of chance, and it's whether or not a study was either too small to detect an effect, or whether it was too small to give us a kind of a reliable picture of what might be going on. So for sufficient evidence, we're looking for something where there's a pretty believable pattern of, uh, in terms of a consistent pattern across many, you know, a number of studies or where the body of studies that are available uh, that you know, point to an increased risk of cancer, but where chance bias and confounding can be ruled out with reasonable confidence. I mean, this is really the crux of looking at the epidemiologic data because even if there is a pattern, if we can't rule these things out, it still puts it into the area of limited evidence. Sometimes we have things that have been studied in a lab. Um, we've had a number of, of good solid animal studies, but there are times where there simply aren't enough studies of humans. Um, and so there are many, many carcinogens that f have had inadequate human evidence. Uh, that is, we simply don't have studies of humans to do it, and the evaluation takes the place really on the basis of their experimental data. There is a fourth category, evidence suggesting a lack of carcinogenicity. Once I know something ended up in category four, so it must have had this, uh, but of the 900 things that have been looked at, they simply don't fall here. Things that come to IARC generally have something that has scared people, um, to use a simple, a simple thing. And that's either there are some positive epidemiologic studies, there are some animal studies that are positive enough that people think that they may have a carcinogen on their hands, or, or some other kind of experimental evidence there. So it's, it's rare, it's not like we're looking at a lot of things that people would call benign things that don't cause cancer. So this lowest, this category is very, very, I would expect to see it very rarely used. Uh, 
Because in order to do this, you have to have large, very large, what's called adequate negative studies. So very adequate here actually means very good uh, studies that have to be large enough to give people confidence that there really is nothing there. And they have to cover the range of exposures that people are, are likely to experience. So uh, it's a pretty broad uh, set of criteria that has to be met. And so uh, this is very, very hard to meet. So for the human studies, a lot of the discussion revolved around eight studies of breast cancer in women uh, conducted either in the United States or the Nordic countries. I just listed the eight studies here, and I'm going to go through them, but it's just to kind of give you an idea of, of what kind of studies we're talking about here. So this gives you a bit of an idea, but also you'll look over here and you'll see that how shift work was actually defined varied in the studies. And this is one of the challenges uh, that we've had in interpretation, but I'll, I'll come back to that point. In any case, these are the eight studies done over um, about a 10 or 11 year period. Probably the strongest of those studies were two studies of nurses. These were two uh, intakes into the Nurses Health Study in the United States. Uh, this is a study that um, by the time it went to the second intake, it expanded to nurses in 14 different states being recruited and followed over time. And here you can see that among, in both studies, they found an increased risk among long-term um, nurses working on night shifts. It wasn't just ever working on a night shift. In this case, it was working for 30 plus years or 20 plus years um, on, on night shift. So these are, it's kind of an interesting finding, um, but these are considered very strong studies. This the second group of studies here, these are case control studies. So these are studies done in particular geographic areas. Both of these were done in the United States. Um, uh, one was done on the East Coast, one was done around Seattle. Um, they appear to have very similar definitions of what constitutes shift work. But you begin uh, you know, after, after 7 in the evening uh, and, and before 9 in the morning. So you're working over the, you know, either many of your hours are in the evening or overnight. Um, the interesting thing here is that one found a very, very strong result, I mean, at least for this kind of study, uh, and the other one did not. Uh, on the face of it, these studies are fairly similarly designed they used a similar question. One of the questions people had is, they actually got 35% of their people saying that they work shift work. And it made people wonder if, they were at, if the question was being interpreted the same. So this is one of the questions that was raised around this study. This is very high. The United States has very similar patterns of shift work that we do. Uh, there's no reason that Long Island should be that much higher. So the question is, was the phrasing of the question or was it presented differently uh, to make it inconsistent? Because this is one of the, the few inconsistent studies. So our next kind of uh, set here are three what I call Nordic tumor registry-based studies. These are studies that were done where they were designed to use data in the Nordic tumor registries and to link it with other data sets in order to do fairly uh, large studies, and this is very common in the Nordic countries. Um, not so common here, although I think we're starting to move in that direction now in Canada. Uh, it's not possible to do these in the United States for the most part because they lack the kind of universal coverage of the tumor registries. But in Canada, we have good enough coverage that we can do these. Uh, but what they have is census level information on people. So they have occupation, they have industry, um, they have number of children so they can adjust for things like parity. Uh, they don't have um, a whole reproductive history per se. Um, they don't have information necessarily on smoking because the census doesn't gather that. And what they did was they tried to compare the risk of breast cancer in industries where there's a very high proportion of people who work night shifts. And in the case of the Danish study, they selected out the small number of industries where their survey data said that 
60% or more of those folks would work night shifts. Uh, so they took anybody who worked in those industries, because they don't know who the individuals are that work night shifts. They took them out and compared them to other industries that work, uh, have low rates of uh, shift work. The Norwegian study didn't even look at all, all uh, nurses, they, all, all industries. The Norwegian study just looked at hospital nurses. And then they looked if somebody appeared at a host as a hospital nurse three censuses in a row. Um, and then they found you know, a very big increased risk for hospital nurses. You can see one here was uh, negative. In this particular Swedish study, they didn't find anything. So these studies have kind of limited data. They have large numbers of people, so they're very useful in <coughs> Uh, in that, they can be conducted rather quickly to answer questions that people have, but you can see what the limitations are in terms of interpretation. But two of these three studies were positive. What I have here is that five of the eight studies had a clearly increased risk. One had mixed, mixed results, um, but the interpretation of the working group is that basically we had six positive studies and two negative studies in terms of those eight breast cancer studies that I was talking about. The one I didn't talk about was this one, and it's basically the working group decided that this was a positive study. Um, some people didn't think it was the most positive study, but uh, because it was really limited to women above the age of 50, but if you think that you have to be in a job for 20 or 30 years before your risk goes up, maybe that makes sense. So our concerns at the end of looking at this review were that, let's say what we saw was a fairly consistent pattern, at least in terms of the majority of studies have an increased risk, some support evidence from elsewhere, but we were concerned about an inconsistent definition of shift work, uh, that we, did, we had a fair number of studies, but it was still a bit limited, especially considering how many different kinds of studies that we were looking at. Uh, some of the studies focused in on a single profession, um, as I mentioned earlier, and potential for uncontrolled confounding for reproductive factors. And when I say reproductive factors, uh, you know, women who don't have children have an increased risk of breast cancer. Women who work have less children than women who don't work. I mean, that's the simplistic view of it. So not having information when you're studying work-related breast cancer can be a challenge, and many of the studies we're not able to, to, the more simple studies, we're not able to adjust for that. And so that was a concern for us. Here we decided that there was limited evidence in humans for shift work that involved uh, night work. In fact, I'll tell you that even within the working group, we had, we had a range. We had some people who felt the evidence was stronger, some, uh, some weaker, but the great majority of folks actually went with this kind of limited category when it went to the vote of the full committee. The feeling of the group was that, you know, sometimes you have a, a situation where there's, you have a body of studies that are all very similar and there might be some underlying single confounding factor that you could lay it to. Some one thing that you think might run in a number of studies that caused a number of them to go in the same direction. In this case, the fact that we had kind of a real mixed bag, was both a limitation in terms of drawing strong conclusions, but actually, on the other hand, made people think it's not any one item, and yet a lot of these things were all pointing in the same direction. So that was, that was one of the thoughts that came up amongst the working group members. Uh, others were that usually when you measure exposure poorly, it waters out effects, it doesn't necessarily make them kind of peak, and there were a number of studies here that, that did have positive results. But we had other concerns that I think I laid out uh, before. So it was definitely kind of a, a mix of, of things that were going through people's minds. 